organization of uh, living of living matter uh, from single cells to single organisms to collections of organisms um, over the past couple of decades uh, there have been spectacular advances in quantitative experimental techniques uh, that have led to the realization that uh, theory and modeling plays a critical role in biology, just as they do in the traditional uh, traditional disciplines like physics. So by tying together experiments with theory, uh, quantitative biology sort of tries to uncover a deeper understanding of the mechanisms that influence the phenomena of life itself. And we hope that the colloquiums in these series uh, will convey this broad sense of what fascinates physicists about living systems and the principles uh, that govern them. Uh, I would now like to invite our co-organizer, Professor Antonio Cellani from ICTP Trieste to please say a few words, uh, Antonio. Thank you, thank you, Mithun. Thank you all for uh, participating in uh, the first uh, event in this series of colloquia. Um, I just want to express on behalf of ICTP that we are uh, very, very happy that this, uh, this series of events uh, is actually uh, taking place. And uh, we, uh, we are eagerly looking forward to, uh, to further initiatives that uh, can strengthen the ties between uh, ICTP and uh, IIT Mumbai. Uh, so with that, uh, I, I will give you back the floor and looking forward to hear from uh, Edgar. Uh, thanks, thanks, Antonio. Uh, so the first speaker of the series is uh, Edgar Rolden from ICTP. Uh, Edgar did his PhD from the Clompetence University of Madrid. Uh, he was then a postdoctoral fellow at the Material Sciences Institute uh, in Madrid and subsequently at the Institute of uh, Photonic Sciences in Barcelona. In 2014, he moved to the Max Planck Institute uh, for the Physics of Complex Systems in Dresden. Uh, first as a guest scientist, and then in 2016, he became project leader there. So in, since 2018, uh, Edgar has been at ICTP Italy. His research interests lie broadly in the application of this, uh, of this field of stochastic thermodynamics to understanding biological systems. Uh, so he's been awarded uh, various prizes, uh, notably among them the Early Career Prize uh, with the Statistical and Nonlinear Physics Division of the European Physical Society in 2017. So today, Edgar will speak on the stochastic thermodynamics of active fluctuations in the year of the bullfrog. Uh, so before I turn it over to Edgar, uh, just a couple of procedural issues. So all participants are muted by default. Uh, so Edgar, if you are fine with this, uh, we can take questions uh, in the middle of the colloquium as well. Uh, so if any of you have a question, uh, uh, please either use the raise hand feature on Zoom, or you can use the chat box to type out your question. Uh, if you have raised hand, then one of the hosts will unmute you so that you can ask the question yourself. Or if you have typed it into the chat box, then we'll just read it out so that Edgar can address the question. And then at the end of the colloquium, we can, of course, have a more uh, open discussion within the constraints of whatever time remains. Mm -hmm. right. So Edgar, please uh, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mithun. Uh, I'm really uh, pleased to be here. This is a, an excellent opportunity and initiative, joint initiative between us and uh, IIT Bombay, it's uh, really exciting to be the first speaker. Um, I want to say hi also to, to all the crowd, uh, 63 participants at the moment. Uh, I see many people from India, so I hope um, this talk is, is interesting for you. Uh, so I'll, I'll share screen and, and you tell me if you see everything as it should. Um, okay, please let me know if, if you see my slides and also my mouse, you see? I can see the, yeah, yes, you can see it. Yeah. You see yeah. them. Okay, perfect. So, um, so thanks again for the, for the invitation and for you to be there. Uh, today, I'll um, ask me to introduce and discuss on applications of the field of stochastic thermodynamics, which is a, an emerging field in, in statistical mechanics, on, um, to understand the active fluctuations in the ear of the bullfrog. So this might sound to you a bit uh, too distant fields, but um, I'll try to convince you that they are not so distant from each other and that we can apply universal principles on thermodynamics to the fluctuations in the uh, ear of this uh, type of uh, bullfrog that I will uh, introduce to you um, uh, in, a, in a few minutes. So um, this is a bit of an introduction on, on uh, living matter uh, and on how life works. So we know that there are many physical or biophysical phenomena 
that um, are out of equilibrium. So we see, for example, on the top right, uh, a microscope image of a, of a cell division or a molecular motor on the bottom right. Or, or, uh, uh, this was the, the video of a, a flickering of a red blood cell. And this one was of a chlamydomonas uh, swimming in, in, a, in a fluid. Uh, all these biological processes have some um, common grounds in terms of physics. And mostly, they all have to fulfill some thermodynamic rules. In particular, these are all non-equilibrium processes, which are characterized by, OK, nowadays, people call these active fluctuations. But we can just, as, as physicists, call these, these are non-equilibrium because they dissipate heat to the environment in, the, in the, their motion. So they consume energy that comes from mainly hydrolysis of ATP. And they produce entropy. They create disorder in the environment, and they dissipate heat during the motion. So there are some. Um, universal principles that, in principle, should uh, apply also to living matter. So over the last years, as Mitu was um, introducing before, there has been unprecedented um, advances, experimental advances to for humans to interact with living matter and to, to get to know, let's say, the molecular uh, fluctuations of a red blood cell or a DNA herpin or, or an oocyte. And this has raised. Uh, so the, the, the fact that we can now do very precise experiments has raised the question of what can we do with the data from these experiments in terms of understanding, for, for instance, the thermodynamics of these uh, fluctuations. So these are some questions that um, different communities like biophysicists or uh, statistical uh, people in statistical mechanics or even biologists are now trying to answer. For instance, if we can distinguish uh, active and passive fluctuations. So you look at that, you put a probe on a biological system, this probe fluctuates, and you would like to know whether this probe is performing active or passive fluctuations. I will talk a lot about this concept, but this is really a, a hot topic right now in, in uh, statistical mechanics. Also, if we can infer um, from uh, the type of fluctuations that we see, how much heat is being dissipated by a living system, or if we can quantify the arrow of time, so if we can say how much irreversible is a biological process and uh, further theoretical insights that we can think about. So these are many open questions. And I'll try to uh, discuss some of them by focusing on uh, this animal, which is the bullfrog Rana catesbiana. So this is a very scholarly American bullfrog. And uh, I'll discuss fluctuations that take place in the inner ear on these cells that have some protrusions. I will uh, give more details later, which I'll co call the ear head bundles, that um, displays in a, in a fluid, because in the inner ear, we, we have a fluid called uh, the endolymph. So when the sound is transduced, these uh, fibers are moved left to right, and this dissipates heat. So we're trying to understand or to guess or to infer how much heat is dissipated during the hearing process of the bullfrog by looking at experimental data extracted from this process. This is somehow the, the, one of the key goals of, the, of my talk and of my research over the last years. And I'll try to give you some insight about this. But before, uh, as I, I don't know uh, which is your background, it's the first of this series of colloquiums, I, I will introduce a little bit of the anatomy of the, of the ear of the bullfrog. So first of all, what is the ear and what is hearing? So this is a sketch here of a, of a OK, this is a human ear. It's not a bullfrog do, do not have ears like this. They have a succulent. But uh, somehow the working principle is similar than in the bullfrog. So the ear is like a microphone. So in a microphone, you, you talk to the microphone. And uh, so you give a sound, which is a pressure wave that enters the ear. And in the microphone, as you know, the sound is transformed into an electrical uh, signal that goes to the computer, for instance. But we have already this type of microphones in our bodies, because the, the ear is doing this. The sound enters the auditory canal. It's a pressure wave that hits the ear drum. This uh, makes that the, these bones that are connected the ear drum to the inner ear also move and vibrate. And this ultimately generates um, a traveling fluid wave here in the cochlea that stimulates some cells that then generate electrical signals. So in the end, this is a very, very uh, complicated process. But the key point in the sound transduction happens um, here in the cochlea, which um, if we look at the cochlea, it has this type of spiral shape in which um, it's arranged into cells that have this structure. 
and that are sensitive to different stimuli. So this is very particular because it looks like a piano. If you have played piano, you know that uh, there are the tones of high frequency on one side and of low frequency in the other. In the cochlea, we have a structure like this already built, built in. Uh, and this happens in, in our ears. So when you put a sound that is a very high frequency, you will only stimulate these cells. And when you hear a sound that is uh, sensitive to low frequency stimuli, you uh, stimulate this part of the cochlea. This is really fascinating. And uh, okay, this is an image of uh, a piece of tissue of the cochlea. And you see that these are arranged in, in this type of structure that look like uh, I mean, <laughs> modernist buildings, very strange. Uh, and uh, they have fascinated the attention of many physicists, and we are still uh, understanding uh, their uh, non-equilibrium properties. So I'll focus in, in, in one of these. Uh, so this is the epithelium of the bullfrog sacculus. So this is extracted uh, after sacrificing a bullfrog, you extract the tissue and you, you can do an electron microscope and see these structures. So you can take this um, structure out and you discover that this is part of a cell, which is called the ER hair cell. You can see this, this image here. The, these cells have a very big, big uh, cell body. Here is the nucleus. And in the membrane, they have these particular structures called the hair bundle, which is a series of um, uh, filaments that are arranged in this way, uh, which have a size of around seven microns. So uh, in this talk, I'll uh, focus on how these um, hair bundles behave and how the um, their fluctuations are responsible for sound transduction. And uh, I'll, I'll mainly try to discuss um, which are the thermodynamic properties of the oscillations of these hair bundles. Okay, so uh, from now, when I say hair bundle, I will be talking about one of these. As I said, they can have different uh, sizes. This is a bit of a, an average, and uh, there are different, uh, some of them are, are sensitive to, to low uh, uh, frequency stimuli and others to high frequency stimuli. So there is really, in the tissue of, of the ear of the bullfrog, you can get many of these sensitive to different frequencies. So how uh, sound transduction happens? So in the end, uh, the traveling wave in the cochlea bends all these structures. It makes that all the, the these, stereo, these are called stereocilia, these uh, long filaments, they are bent. And this creates that, um, so other filaments that are called tip links, which connect uh, each of these stereocilia are stretched. And when they stretch, they uh, generate the opening of an ion channel. So here, this is a microscope image of the ion channels that are um, present in the, in the structure. So when the ion, ion channel opens, they allow the passage of calcium and potassium ions, which then uh, are the responsible of the electrical current that goes to the auditory nerve. So this is a bit Edgar, of, Edgar yeah. there is one question. Uh, I'll just read it out from Anirban. Yeah. So he's asking, how is this conical structure that you showed that is connected to the spiral that you showed? Uh, ah, yes, yes. Very good question. So, uh, so if you have this spiral structure and, uh, okay, this has a basilar membrane. So if you take a piece of this tissue, and so if you, <laughs> I don't know how to say, but maybe I can do uh, an image. So if you take a small region here and you chop it, then you see this one. This is a magnification of, of a small region here. Okay, so this, this, this is like a very, very thin uh, uh, film in which there are all these um, cells arranged in this vertical arrangement. Thanks. Make... thanks. Okay. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Okay, okay. All right. Uh, okay, mm. so I, I was discussing that this, um, this is the way. Um, Air cells transduce sound into an electrical signal, and uh, of course, this is not a um, this is an active process because um, the ion channels are connected also to uh, molecular motors that are responsible of adaptation. The adaptation is the phenomenon in which, when you hear a very very strong noise, your your ear is able to adapt to very strong um, stimuli, and this is done thanks to the action of these motors that are moving also the the, the channels and therefore they are responsible of uh, changing the, the length dynamically of, of these tip links. So here there is ATP consumption. This is an active process and still um, we are trying to, to, to understand how much uh, energy is dissipated in this, in this phenomenon. But this is just to tell you a bit of the, the biology of, the, of this process. 
Okay, as a physicist, there are many uh, fascinating features for this uh, from that have been discovered for the ear health bundles. One is amplification, so they are able. So this is an experiment where they they put one of these hair bundles in a in a plate and they move uh, the base of the plate. And this is the motion of the of, of the base, and they see that the tip of the cell moves with higher amplitude. So they can amplify sound or, or stimuli. Uh, another important feature is frequency selectivity. So different animals we are sensitive to stimuli of uh, in a range of frequencies. So for example, uh, lizards can hear sounds that we cannot. Nonlinear response is another important. Um, uh, Edgar, problem. excuse me. Uh, there is another question. Uh, yes. So Dibendu has asked, uh, how do the hair bundles in different regions, sensitive to different frequencies, differ? Uh, okay, this is what I'm trying to to explain now. So <laughs> you can see uh, okay. this is experimental. It's not a it's not a model. And, and, and they could, uh, experimental techniques, measure the, the, the sensitivity of, okay, this of the entire year to different frequencies. It is still an open question how this works. So it's, uh, what we can do is to, to extract the, the cells, see how they look, and then try to guess why. Uh, so how can you make something, um, say, um, sensitive to one frequency and not sensitive to another? This is a big question it's still, uh, it's, a, it's an open question in the field. So we know it happens, we know, um, because you can, you can take out from the frog cells from different parts of the tissue and see that they oscillate at different frequencies. Okay, so this is just, let's say uh, an empirical observation as for now. And still uh, we're trying to understand uh, why uh, in some parts the ear is sensitive to high frequencies and why in other parts to low frequencies. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Welcome. All right. So uh, another um, important phenomenon is that uh, they have nonlinear response. So when you um, listen the sound of a needle falling close to you, uh, your um, this is a, a given uh, amplitude in decibels. Whereas when you go on the streets and then there is a construction works, you will hear a sound that has. 10 to the four times the amplitude of the of, of the fall of a needle, there. But um, your ear doesn't re respond uh, in a linear way. So if your ear would respond 10 to the four times stronger to the sound of a construction work, you will probably die. So you need a um, you need a system that is able to uh, respond to to different amplitudes in a non-linear way. And this is uh, actually have been shown in, in many experiments. And finally, the one that I, I will uh, talk most is something called spontaneous oscillations. It means that the ear doesn't need sound to oscillate. So if you look at these hair bundles and you put them in a quiet environment, they still vibrate and, and uh, develop this type of spontaneous motion. So if you put yourself in a quiet uh, room with a very, very precise microphone, you will hear sound coming from your ear. And this is due to the fact that there are molecular motors that are consuming energy and they, they generate this type of active motion. So this is a very fascinating phenomenon, I believe. Um, uh, we are trying to understand how this works and how is this possible from a physical point of view. So one more thing, Edgar, if I may. So there is yes. another question uh, that are the hair bundle frequency uh, sensitivities related to the sizes, the sizes of the bundles? Um... Uh, it's not clear, it's not clear. Okay. I, I'm, I'm not 100% sure. So uh, I think it's not clear yet. I it's not clear I yet because you can have also different hair bundles with, okay. Um, so here I show you, for instance, one case which have maybe 50 of this uh, sterocilia, but there are others which have 30. Uh, so uh, there's not a one to one relation between number of sterocilia or height and frequency, as far as I know, as far as I know. but. Uh, I invite okay, you to, okay. to take a look to to a recent biology paper because maybe this is a better known right now. It, it's an thanks. open it's an open area of research. Oh, thanks, thanks. And about the spontaneous oscillations, is there like some characteristic frequency that depends on the yes, motor? Yes. Okay. yes, yes, yes. This is clear. So if you see here in the frog, um, you will see that there are, there are some um, characteristic frequencies in the in the fluctuations. And this is what I'm going to show you in, in three or four slides. So you will see. 
So, okay. so the, this, this time series here is not like a particle in a double well with exponential waiting times. It's not like that. And this is a key insight of, of from the Hellbound. You'll see. So it's an oscillation with a given frequency plus noise. You'll see. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I will talk about this in a few minutes. But yes. So uh, physicists have tried to, to uh, come out with the models that describe this type of spontaneous oscillations. And at the beginning of the, uh, of the Herbant studies, there were many proposals were about uh, the fact that the, the ear may be near a critical point. Uh, yet there was this uh, very influential paper that found that uh, it was, you see, a critique of the critical cochlea. So he was saying, I hope bifurcation is better than none. So here they propose dynamical systems near a hope bifurcation as uh, paradigmatic models for these oscillations. You can find uh, some information about this in the great book by Strogat on dynamical systems. And think, for example, of a complex number. Uh, and here I'm plotting the complex number, uh, I think the complex plane, uh, which its radius and, and angle follow these equations, which are uh, differential equations that are nonlinear. And uh, you can have, for when changing this parameter mu, you can ch uh, change your dynamics in a way of Hopf bifurcation, which means that you go from a situation where there is one stable point to a situation in which this stable point becomes unstable and it opens up, and then you have a stable orbit in which you perform oscillations. So, okay, this is no connection. I'm not talking about any biological parameter here, but this is just a, a physical system that can have these spontaneous oscillations. So this whole bifurcation can be of different types. I, I won't uh, discuss much now, but I invite you to, to take a look to the book of Strogatz. But the main point is that um, this idea is um, it's very useful to discuss the possibility of having a model that has one stable solutions in which you, you have one stable point here from where you may escape because of fluctuations or oscillatory solutions in which you have the system oscillating continuously. Of course, this was only the beginnings in which there were these models which have no noise. So one cannot have this type of oscillations with noise with these models. One has to add thermal noise, for instance, but yet with this type of uh, modeling, uh, one can get very, very um, uh, many of the, of the key features of the hair bundle, like uh, very sharp power spectra, nonlinear response, etc. So it was a very important uh, development in the field of, of hair bundle modeling. Yet, however, it has been 40 years of modeling. So 40s, 2010s and 20s, people have been uh, developing different um, models, starting from dynamical systems close to hope bifurcation. In the 2000s, uh, there were developments of models which are two-dimensional or three-dimensional Langevin non-isothermal models. It is not isothermal because we think of one variable is the top of the cell, another variable is where are the motors, and the motors are active, so the fluctuations are not in a thermal bath, they are in an effective temperature somehow. Uh, then the next decade, there were many multi-dimensional Langevin models with non-linear forces, so this is important that Nonlinearities are key to, to, to reproduce most of the experimental data. And in the last decade, uh, okay, there are many developments. For example, this is a very nice idea of a hidden Vanderpol oscillator, um, or we just propose another uh, model which is linear, but which has no Markovian noise and we can solve. I will talk about this uh, at the end of the, of the talk. So this is one of the uh, most important uh, models in, the, in this. Uh, one of these, uh, I think this was in the 2010s or so, um, which has um, is described by three nonlinear couple um, stochastic differential equations. Uh, as I said, this is the position of the top of the bundle, and this is the position of the motors. This one is the uh, concentration of calcium in the cell. I won't enter into details here, but just to tell you that this model has been fitted to experiments. You see here, this is for the question of Mithun the power spectrum density of the uh, spontaneous oscillation has a peak. So they have a, a, a def, uh, characteristic frequency. And this model can fit the experiment very well. Moreover, uh, for different parameter choices, you can uh, uh, build this type of phase diagram in which you can have bistable oscillations, monostable, 
and also this oscillatory regime I was talking about. Uh, and uh, an important question is where is the experimental data in this diagram? So the experimental data from this paper is shown to be right in this point, so close to a hot bifurcation. So here we go from monostable to oscillatory through a hot bifurcation. So it has been really the, say, the bread and butter of the, co uh, of the community to establish that the year of the bullfrog is close to a hot bifurcation. So this is something, let's say, well accepted in the community because of these experimental advances. Okay, so these models, they are not only like nice to fit data, but they are also good to do predictions. And this is a, a very fascinating work where they coupled a real hair bundle to a computer. So they had a computer that was performing the simulations of this model here. So the computer is integrating Langevin equations and responding to the motion of the cell, um, the, the real motion, experimental motion of the cell. And what they observe is that, okay, first, they can have synchronization between the, these cyber clones or virtual cells and the real cell. And also that the response of the cell in this case is the same as if you have it in a real tissue. So this is a very, very strong way of, of validating a model. And it's really a crazy experiment if you think about. Uh, but then later on, it was shown that the head bundles not only oscillate spontaneously, but when they are close to each other, you can put probes on top of them and see that they, as, uh, after some time, they can synchronize. So if you put them in a, in a medium where they are connected but through their base, they, okay, there is a raise hand, they can, uh, uh, synchronize among each other. I think there is a question. So I'm happy to. Yeah, I'll just unmute. Uh... Please. Hello. Hi. Hi. Hello. Hi, hello. Yeah, I had a question. Uh, if you can go back to the PSD diagram uh, of the previous page. Uh, so what, which, uh, which parameters does that uh, correspond to? And just a quick question, what are S and F max again? I think I missed it. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, very good question. So this model has around 20 parameters. So um, <laughs> I invite you to go to the paper and see the parameters because they are, uh, these are mechanical parameters, for example, the the stiffness of the, for example, this is the sterocilia pivot stiffness. So it's the stiffness of the sterocilia to move in the basilar membrane. This is the stiffness of the tip links. So there are many mechanical parameters which you can extract from the fit. They are uh, available here. And uh, these two parameters are somehow the ones that they cannot be measured in any other way. So there are different ways to estimate frictions, stiffnesses, diffusion coefficient, et cetera. But these two, they are, they are like three parameters across the, the, the fit. So one is the maximum, this is called F max, is the maximum force done by the motors. So we assume that the motors are fluctuating and they exert forces, they are, appear here on the, on the bundle. And uh, this is, okay, this is like a sigmoidal shape uh, and it has a maximum value, which is called F max. So this is the maximum force exerted by a motor uh, of the adaptation motors. And this S is a parameter that is called the calcium feedback strength, which tells you how strong is the um, feedback of the calcium concentration on the motors. So somehow this is a parameter that relates C to XA, and this is a parameter that relates XA to X in a brief, uh, very briefly, okay? For details, I invite you to to take a look at this reference. Does it reply? Your Thank, <laughs> thanks, thanks. I think you can continue. Okay. All right. So, okay, this is another fascinating uh, phenomenon that we observe. And uh, as from now, I will focus among all these uh, features on the spontaneous oscillations. I'll try to understand what can one do with the uh, experimental traces. Experimentally, one can put a fiber uh, close to the head bundle, as we show here, and move the deflection of a fiber as a function of time, which has this type of um, uh, shape. This is a typical time series of 20 nanometer amplitude and uh, frequency of typically, for example, here before I was showing a uh, frequency of eight hertz. So in the bullfrog, we can extract uh, and resolve oscillations of eight hertz in this case. So, um, 
of course, experimental life is quite hard. So I think most of you are theorists, so I will <laughs> skip this. So I tell you there is a fiber that we can look uh, on top of it, but this is taken from the uh, PhD thesis of my colleague, and it's a very complicated uh, device. So, so when you see one day, day time series, please uh, take into account that this took a lot of, a lot of work and calibrations. And I start with my questions for, for you. So what can TH Smith do about Batrachians? And you may ask what this TH Smith, uh, this is a bit of a joke, but I take it from this paper by Christian Miles, which says TH Smith is the statistical mechanician in the street. So uh, someone like you may be a statistical mechanician and would like to know if you get data from a biological experiment, what can you do from your street knowledge on statistical mechanics? So the first thing uh, we may wonder is you, you take a, an experimental time series and you would like to know if it's equilibrium or non-equilibrium. This work um, answered this question by revealing that these fractations are active. So please take into account that this is 2000. So now there is a lot of work on active matter, but um, this active matter has really a long story. So just keep, keep an eye on this paper. Uh, and what they do is they compare the spontaneous fluctuations of the bundle to the response. So they look also at the bundle when this probe is uh, it's exer exerting a sinusoidal force. So we will get two time series, the spontaneous and the forced time series, and uh, one can analyze them uh, and try to see if we, with this two time series, one can get, uh, say that this is equilibrium or non-equilibrium. So to answer this question, we can use uh, common knowledge in uh, statistical mechanics, namely the green Kubo, uh, sorry, the Kubo fluctuation dissipation theorem. So, um, as you know, you can take a collet, for example, in a thermal bath, uh, have a time series, and compute the autocorrelation function of the time series, which is defined like this, and from it, uh, obtain the Fourier transform, which is called the power spectrum, mainly. And on the other side, you can do an, a second experiment where you, um, you drive this colloid. So there is a trap and you move the colloid sinusoidally and look at the average motion of this colloid as a function of time and build from this the linear response function. So you assume the, the force is small. So you put a small force, sinusoidal force, and you can extract this quantity, which is the response function, which is typically uh, complex. So it has a real and an imaginary part. So Kubo found that if the bath is in equilibrium, these two quantities are related through uh, this equation, which is called the fluctuation dissipation theorem. This part is the fluctuation in the sense that you just look at the spontaneous fluctuations. And this is the dissipative part, part of the response. And you see that here, uh, the, the relation is through the temperature of the bath. So you must have a, an equilibrium thermal bath uh, driving these fluctuations. So, Let's, let's do what uh, statistical mechanism can do is to test if this theorem works. So you get a time series, you build, you see the stationary density is, is bimodal, and you can compute the autocorrelation function, which has this type of uh, oscillations, and from it, the power spectrum. So what I showed you before is just the Fourier transform of this, of, of this uh, function. On the other hand, you can force the, the hair bundle with a sinusoidal force of different frequencies, and see that the response function of to this uh, force has a, okay, a very particular behavior because it has a peak, the real part has a peak, and the imaginary part changes sign in a given frequency. And this is exactly at the frequency of the spontaneous oscillations, eight hertz. So now you take this one and the power spectrum, you compare them, and you show that if you do these two experiments on a passive cell, so post-mortem, the fluctuation dissipation theorem holds for any frequency. So you do the experiment at different frequencies and you get the fluctuation dissipation is fulfilled. On the other hand, when you do this to an active cell, you see fluctuation dissipation is broken. And uh, this is a, a signature of the fact that these fluctuations are non equilibrium It's a very, very strong proof. However, uh, you, may, you may want to, to go deeply in this question. So it's not only a binary question, are you in equilibrium or not? Well, of course, we guess it must be out of equilibrium because it's an active process. Uh, but you'd like to know how far from equilibrium. You'd like to quantify the entropy production, for example, in, in the motion of the hair bundle. And for this, we, we published a paper last year, but uh, it took us a lot of time. So I started this as a PhD student. 
So it's nine years of research. It's a long time. So uh, I'll try to give you a fresh update on this. So first of all, uh, there is this fact that currents are a footprint of, of irreversibility. So if you think of a simple model like a Markov process with three states, if you are in equilibrium, you will have no current, so no net current between any two states. And this will imply that the entropy production, which is usually formulated as the sum of uh, suitable forces times currents, is zero in an equilibrium process. Let's say when, when you have a Markov chain where, with all the rates uh, fulfilling detailed balance. However, when you have non-equilibrium stationary states, uh, it means that you are biasing the rate. For example, here you go more clockwise than counterclockwise. You have currents between all the states, and this is a signature of heat dissipation, so or or entropy production, which typically takes this form. So, uh, in the last years, in in the field of stochastic thermodynamics, uh, it was there was a big development on how to compute the entropy production of a of a, um, the entropy production rate of a process, for instance, a, a Langevin dynamics in, in two dimensions in terms of stochastic trajectories produced by this process. And here I cite a result that is valid for, for all uh, non-equilibrium process in the stationary state, in which we do the following. First, we look at the uh, trajectory, is a single trajectory in a phase space. For example, here is two variables. So you have this sequence of, of, of um, states. And uh, you look also at the time reverse trajectory, and of course, if, if this is an equilibrium process, you will see more time the blue than the red. Sorry, if it's equilibrium, you will see the same time, <laughs> the same number of times blue than red. But if it's non-equilibrium, there will be drifts. So you will see more times this trajectory than this one. It turns out, and we can show in, in, uh, in stochastic thermodynamics that computing the uh, cool back level divergence, which is, uh, let's say, the this is a measure of how different is the probability to see a trajectory with respect to the probability to see the time reversal trajectory. If we compute this quantity, this is related to the entropy production, and in fact, is a lower bound always to the entropy production. So whatever coarse graining you do, if you build trajectories and you do probabilities of trajectories and time reversals, this quantity will give you a lower bound to the real entropy production, which is a physical quantity. So on this uh, left-hand side, we have a quantity that it will depend on the, on the specific model. So some models are isothermals, and this is just the heat over the temperature. Other models are, have two thermal baths, and this takes a different espresso. So this is the physics. Whereas this on the right is just a statistical quantity. So it's just computing probabilities of trajectories and, and reversals. So of course, um, your estimates to the entropy production will depend strongly on how many variables you see. So here we can see with two variables, we can see currents and compute the reversibility with two variables, which is close to the entropy production in some examples. Whereas if you don't see the two variables, for example, you see only x1, you have like something oscillating, but you cannot see currents. So it's very complicated with uh, one variable to see entropy production. So these bounds that we establish are um, not always informative. So if you reduce a lot the amount of information you will you will get very very weak bounds to the entropy production, and this is the the case of um, the hair bundles. In the hair bundle in the experiment, we only get one variable, so it is really challenging if we want to estimate entropy production from something that doesn't have a current. So you go the same time, same number of times left than right. You are oscillating. So uh, we try to do this uh, to estimate the reproduction from one variable uh, with in 182 recordings of so these are 182 bullfrogs. Each uh, recording has 30 seconds. Each recording... yeah, God, excuse me. Uh, there is a yes. question. Uh, so the question by Rajeshi is like, what happens if the dynamics in underdamped, if the dynamic dynamics is underdamped, where velocity is also a slow variable? Will your formalism for entropy production and bonds hold? Yes, yeah, so here I'm assuming overdamp. All the variables are overdamp, but you can extend this to underdamp. Uh, the only thing that you, you have to be very careful is that in underdamp, they are not only Xs, they are also Vs. So when you time reverse the trajectory, you have to change the sign of the velocities. 
So you can do it in under damp. You can do it in under damp, but instead of having only x's, you will have also x. It will be x1 and v1, x2 and v2, etc. And here there will be minus v's. So one can do it also with, with velocities. Okay. Yet experimentally, it's very difficult to measure the real velocity. But, but one can extend this. I can give you a reference if you're interested about this. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. All right. So uh, this is our challenge. Um, we'd like from this time series to estimate the underlying entropy production. So I repeat, we need to compute the probability for trajectories in the probability of the time reversals. And uh, there has been many uh, developments. Uh, we, for example, using the Grassberger Procaccia algorithm, which I call the Coolant tasks, because they, they basically uh, try to compute. So they discretize the time series and they try to compute probabilities of very long sequences. And you see, you have to do T going to infinity. So that's quite complicated. So we under, uh, introduced a trick, which was the following we take the time series and the time reversals, and we apply to them a whitening filter. So what we are doing is mapping. So we pass this by a machine, gives you a new time series. And now we pass the reversal time series for, to the same machine and gives you another time series. I'm skipping details, but this is called in, uh, actually in machine learning, they use it a lot. It's called whitening transformations in which you, you do a one-to-one -one transformation between the original trajectories and the new trajectories such that the new trajectories are IID. So the original time series have correlations, and this one are IID. And yet, using the same transformation, you can see that the distribution of this IID process are different when there are irreversibilities in the original time series. So this map is very efficient because you map the original, so the original autocorrelation function is like this, and the autocorrelation function of the white end time series is zero. So you can do this very, very easily with a computer. Uh, and the main advantage is that this simplifies a lot the calculation of entropy production. So when you are in, the, in an IAD process, you don't need to compute anymore the probabilities of the entire se sequence, but the, the one-time probability density. Okay, it's a major simplification. So you just do the, the transformation, you have two new time series, and you compute the histogram. That's it. You don't need anymore to look at trajectory probabilities. Okay, I'm skipping many details, but um, this is the trick. I'm just trying to give you a, a first smell on how this works. And for more details, I, I encourage you to, to look at the paper. Or I can also explain you later more. So if we apply this technique uh, of uh, whitening and we, we compute irreversibility by, by this difference of, of, of histograms, uh, we can apply this to experimental time series and to also, um, let's say, a negative control, which is a particle jumping in a double well. When a particle jumps in a double well, if you assume this is equilibrium, you will have also these jumps, yet you know it's equilibrium. So when we apply this measure uh, as a function of the number of data that we use, you see that this case gives you zero irreversibility within the, the error, whereas the experimental cases, they give you positive irreversibility. So we can distinguish between these ones, which are hard to say they are irreversible, from a purely equilibrium case. So this seems to work. Moreover, we can apply this technique to different uh, conditions. For example, these are cells that are active, so they are consuming ATP, and you see that this irreversibility is, is larger than when we take the cells and we drag them. So we put a drag that doesn't allow the channels to open and close, so they are somehow passive, and they have less irreversibility, and this irreversibility is of the passive is comparable to the one of the experimental noise. So we can classify different cells in between active and passive very efficiently. Yet, uh, something I didn't say is that how this sigma one, so this, this irreversibility in the white end time series compares to entropy production. This is an open question. And what we try to do is to, to use models because we don't know the second variable. In reality, typically we have two D oscillators. We don't know the second variable, the position of the motors. But we can use simulations of, of the model, like I show here, to compare the reversibility in X1 to the full entropy reduction in this phase space. And the main result is that in this Fmax S diagram in the oscillatory regime, we detect 
in the in the cellular regime we detected reversibility this is the place where there isn't reproduction but yet the order of magnitude is very low so we say 10 10 to the one here whereas the reproduction is 10 to the four so we are still far with sigma one to detect entry reproduction compared to the case when we have two variables where we see these things very well we almost collapse the real entry reproduction so this is a bit uh, a bit of a pity from this approach so we try to uh, get one step further and the step further is if you are able to infer the second variable so of course this you could do by um, imposing this model using machine learning and getting the time series x2 this would be a very beautiful approach but we we try to do a, an approach that doesn't require machine learning that is simplifying this model and have a second variable that is easier to to infer and this is what we we did in this last paper uh, introducing this non markovian model okay i think i'm a bit uh, tight in time but uh, i'll try to give you a brief idea so this is an effective model in which uh, we say that we have a particle in one potential and the potential is switched to another potential. You go from blue to red. And these are two harmonic potentials that have different centers. So you are switching the harmonic potentials at random times. Okay. So the particle is trying to follow these switches. And you see here, the dash line is the C process, uh, which is uh, jumping between two states. And the blue is X process, which is trying to adapt to these jumps. The main point is that these switches happen with a time distribution that is arbitrary. We, uh, we set it arbitrary. So it uh, therefore breaks little balance between the jumps. So it's, it's a non equilibrium process. Uh, the nice thing of uh, the approach that we, we introduced uh, in this, in this uh, preprint is that we select, so we put the two distributions, the top and in the bottom state of the, of the C process here of the center. We set it as um, arbitrary. So there are two waiting time distributions that are arbitrary. So if you put them uh, exponential, you will have a Markovian process whose uh, power spectrum looks like this, like a Lorentzian. Whereas if you put them uh, non exponential, like uh, we have a, a peak, you will have a non Markovian process, which is very important, and the spectrum has a peak. So this looks more like what we see in the bullfrogs. Moreover, um, we can solve, okay, there are two big classes of, of models when, it, when the exponential value times are exponential and when they are not exponential. When they are exponential, we can solve the problem analytically and see, for example, that the distribution of the, of the, uh, of the tip of the bundle can be unimodal or bimodal. Uh, so we, we find that there is this type of phase diagram, which depends on two parameters. So uh, this R is the average time between the jumps. So when you switch very, very fast, you cannot be by model. So you need to switch slow, but yet the C0 cannot be, uh, the C0 has to be large enough so you can resolve the two uh, peaks. So this we can derive analytically and it resolves somehow all this part of the, uh, of the diagram. So we can take, um, we can describe it is small, monostable, unimodal, and bistable. This part yet uh, is not taken into account in that model. So it's a model valid for all this region uh, of the head bundle. So why I'm saying that we don't uh, use exponential distributions is motivated by experiments. So we took uh, experimental data and tried to fit the waiting time distributions um, uh, to try to fit it to any function, we found a very good agreement between the experimental data and a gamma distribution, like the one I show here. It's a power times an exponential. This motivated us to introduce this model, but um, it also um, allowed us to do predictions on the data. So here I introduce you to Alfred, which is uh, one uh, of our bullfrogs uh, from Jim Husted lab. And here you see the experimental time series and the, the stationary distribution. And what we do is we compute the autocorrelation function and we fit it to the, um, uh, to, to, to the analytical value. So for this case, even though the psi's are non-exponential, so the dynamics of X is non-Markovian, we can still, even though it's non-Markovian, find analytically the expression for the autocorrelation function. So somehow we take Alfred, it's here, we look at the time series, we build 
to the correlation function, and we fit it to, a, to our um, formulas. And from here, we extract the parameters. So somehow it's, a, it's an advantage with respect to previous models, which were not analytically solvable. So we can now do predictions of the Hellman. This is Alfred. Uh, OK, this is about spectrum. But we have also Manfred, uh, in which uh, you see the agreement between experiment and, and, and the theoretical fits are perfect. And this is Lothar. And Lothar also is very well fitted by, by this uh, uh, minimal model. Uh, and then, uh, OK, this is the last thing I will, I will tell you is that not only we can fit uh, the data to a model, but we can do predictions for thermodynamics. Because now this is a very simple model in which you introduce energy whenever there is a jump. So if, when the particle jumps up, you are, uh, you are exerting work on the system. And whereas when the particle jumps down, you are extracting work. So we are computing the, um, somehow the energy changes of the, of, of the system whenever uh, these uh, switches happen. Okay, this is the theory, but uh, what we can compute is how this changes in time on average. So if there is a power dissipation in the year, we get this nice expression, which depends on the parameters and also on, on the Laplace transforms of the waiting times distributions, which we say is gamma. So it's a very simple formula evaluated at the relax. Um, this is our like, um, characteristic frequency. This is the stiffness of the trap divided by the friction. So this is a very nice formula that is uh, generic for any waiting time distribution. And now what we do is we take the data of Alfred, Manfred, and Lothar, we extract the parameters, we plug in here in the power, and we get an estimate of the power dissipated in these oscillations, which is uh, much bigger than what we are getting with the reversibility measure. The reversibility measure was like <laughs> 0 0.01 here. You get around 100 kbts per cycle. Sorry, in the reversibility measure, we were getting one kbt per cycle. Now we get 10 kbts per cycle. So it means that for every oscillation cycle, you have to burn an energy of order 100 kbts. So it is not a fluctuation. If it's a fluctuation equilibrium, it will be one kbt. So this is really a, a clear signature of activity and of, of, of dissipation in the system. And this coincides, it's, it's the same order of magnitude as the full entropy production that I reported before with the more complicated model. So this is a simplification and it's a very robust tool that you can fit to many things. And indeed, um, with this, I will give the, the last uh, technical slide, which is there is a lot of interest uh, in the last few years, 2019, on revealing reversibility in waiting times. It's not only us, but uh, this, this very beautiful paper by uh, Martinez Visker, Parondo, Horowitz, Nature Communications, which also pinpoints that if you, if you have asymmetric waiting times, you can detect irreversibility. There is also this uh, really good paper, Nature Physics, where they, they look at a cell crawling in this um, two chamber compare, compar uh, compartment and they look at the waiting times in each state. And it's also like non exponential, uh, like the one we use. So one could use our techniques to estimate the dissipation in this model. There is also this uh, very crazy application of um, irreversibility. So entropy production estimate from waiting times in cows. So you can look at a cow, how long it stays uh, sleeping and, and, and awake. And uh, they estimated in this PRL paper uh, entropy production from cows. <laughs> and and uh, finally, OK, we will also have a contribution on uh, more theoretical uh, coming next week in archive about uh, also waiting times which I hope that you can read soon. Uh, so with this, I, I will conclude. Uh, I have three main conclusions. So the first is that stochastic thermodynamics has been applied through decades to very, uh, let's say a reduced set of experiments like colloids, molecular motors, DNA hairpins, electrons. But now I think the best is coming because still there are a few applications on real biological process. And, and this is one of them. Like, we are, we are highlighting this, and, and this is only one of the many possible directions. Second is, uh, OK, for bullfrogs, we estimate a dissipation of around eight, 10 ATP per cycle. So I said around 100 kbts per cycle. And this is around 
1080p. So maybe we are starting to, to uh, infer the number of ATP molecules necessary to, to drive the system. Uh, and this is an important result because the molecular motors um, uh, is, a, is an hypothesis. In the end, they know there's myosin, but nobody has seen the molecular motors in the microscope moving because these experiments, they do cryo-EM, so they kill the cell to see the structure. Um, and then, okay, the truth is yet out there. I mean, there are still many things to do, uh, like uh, look at the power and efficiency of, of sound transduction. We are, we are using spontaneous oscillations. We are not looking at the transduction yet. The frenetic aspects, it's another direction in, in stochastic thermodynamics, uh, ideas from optimal control, etc. So the, there's much things to do. As you see, there are many open questions, yet this is a, a system that is known since 40 years. Okay, I would like to finish with acknowledgments to all my collaborators in this um, in these adventures on the bullfrog, and also my group that is still right now, the people who are working with me directly. Uh, also the QLS section, in which I'm, I'm working uh, since four years in, in terms of the environment. Uh, I want to highlight two people here in this list, Roman and Gennaro. Roman has been postdoc here two years and has done most of his work uh, on the last part. And also Gennaro did the pitch team here in CISA and now just moved to MPI Gottingen for a postdoc. And the last work is mainly thanks to him. Uh, I would like to thank for your attention. Uh, this is the place we work. Uh, and. Uh, this is the website from our institute, and I leave you with this beautiful Batrachian for the end of my talk. Thank you. Thank you, Edgar. Uh, that was that was a really uh, nice talk. Uh, so I think uh, we can take questions. We have some time. So um, okay. So I see. Please, if you anyone has questions, please raise hands, and we'll then unmute you, and you can ask the question. Uh, so I think Ishant uh, has a question. So Ishant, please. Uh, Hello. Please, please. Hi. Uh, uh, thank, thank you for the informative talk, Professor Rolden. Uh, I just have uh, two uh, questions I would like to ask. Uh, first one is, uh, uh, in the end, you mentioned uh, this uh, the switching of harmonic potentials when you simulate it. So uh, I want to ask, um, I, I, maybe I misunderstood. So is something similar happening in the hair bundles inside the bullfrog? Is the, is the equilibrium of the hair bundles shifting from one to the other? Uh, is that why the model is predicting so well? Yeah, indeed. Uh, so if I show you the time series, uh, okay, there, there's a big collection of time series. So I don't think I can, I can give you all of them, but um, if you look at the time series, uh, you see that it looks like uh, that there are two stable points in which you are um, jumping between each other, but there is a relaxation. So this doesn't happen instantaneously. Okay. So, so if you zoom in this, this time series, you will see uh, a relaxation towards uh, um, an equilibrium, point, more or less. But it, it depends a lot on, on the time series. So some of the time series look like this, and you can uh, describe this model. But others look like sharks. So they are extremely reversible. They, are, they, they do. Okay. Um, I don't know if, if I can draw here, but some time series look like this. OK? So <laughs> there's a oh, big phenomenology, okay. and we can, we can uh, fit uh, a uh, subset of all the illustrations, mainly the ones that look by stable, like the ones I show here. Okay, uh, thank you for this answer. I have just one small uh, question, uh, another question, which is uh, if when you mention the spontaneous sound that one hears in a quiet room, the, are you talking about tinnitus? The, that, that sound that uh, when ah. you are in an, you hear an explosion or something that sounds... I don't know. So uh, I can tell you a, a very fascinating case. Um, okay, of course, um, what I'm showing in the last data is just a single cell. So this is a sound that you will not hear unless you have a, an incredible amplifier. But I can tell you a case that I, I, I knew in, in, in Germany yeah. of a patient who, who had some strange mutation in the ear and it was a family and, and uh, this family had, uh, at, at night, they were realizing that the daughter were, was somehow producing sound and they didn't know what was going on. So 
it seems like some humans, they produce sound from the ears. It's, it's like a spontaneous production of, of sound that can be measured uh, with a microphone. So it's, uh, it's really at the level, physiological level. So we are continuously producing sound, even though if you put yourself in a quiet room, will be still producing sound because the motors are alive. They are consuming ATP and, and moving these structures. So it's, uh, I don't know if this answers your question, but uh, yeah, this is what I meant somehow. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you so much for your answers. You're uh, welcome. Uh, Sri Laja, uh, you can go ahead, please. Uh, you can go ahead with the question. Yeah. Um, so I had a couple of questions actually. So um, one of the questions was uh, in the in the theoretical models that you are building, uh, how do you account for attenuation of sound? So in biological systems, um, the sound stops, therefore you stop hearing it. But the stereocilia have a period of recalcitrance because it is a mechanical perturbation. It requires some time to reset back to state zero. So in the, in the theory um, aspects, how is this accounted for? Uh, this is not yet accounted because um, this model is for a single cell. It's not for, the, for an, let's say, a collection of cells. So you would like to see like the traveling waves and the, the cochlea passing yeah. through a collection of cells. This is uh, not accounted by our model because we are at the level of a single cell. Mm. But uh, there are very interesting um, recent modeling from, I think the Bostrovic lab is doing this in UCLA. Uh, in which they, they, they model a collection of cells coupled to each other, in which uh, uh, a stimuli is passing and it has a spatial structure as well, space time. So one would need to extend the model to many, many degrees of freedom, but in principle, one, one should be able to do it. So in, uh, if, in theory, if you multiplex cells, because stereocilia, uh, the, the cilia are arranged in a particular pattern, and that pattern ah, okay. is traditionally. Okay, okay, okay. So, sorry. There's another paper you can take a look, uh, which is I will write in the in the chat. Uh, take a look. Okay, I'm trying to send. I think it's a paper by Baumgartner. Hannes Baumgartner et, et al. I, I forgot the year. Okay. It's in nature, not nature, but in nature. Uh, this is a very good model of, which is a mechanical model, let's yeah. say en engineer type of the stereocilia with all the elements and so on. Uh, these type of studies were very popular uh, okay. uh, also, and, and they give an idea of this, but it's not, let's say I'm not an engineer. I, I look at uh, very tiny things, which is a single cell, uh, yeah. and, and I'm, I'm doing a very effective model in which I, I'm ignoring really the atomic resolution. But if you look at this paper, you will see uh, uh, something, uh, some work in this direction. Okay. My other question, I got the chat thing, I looked that up. Um, my other question was, um, in, at, at a single cell level as well, um, when cilia are lost, when a collection of cilia are lost, would your model be able to tell what are the, um, let's say the breaking points of that cell, which when hit the cell stops responding? Can you repeat the question? So the, um, the model is based on the uh, movement of one cell cilia. Yes, okay, well, one, impo one important point, and this is also the question of Arna Pal, is um, what you look is at the motion of, of the, tip of, of these cells. You see, this is, in the, right. this is the outer membrane of the cell and this protrusion. So you look right. at the motion of the tip of the herbal. Right. It's a single right. cell. Yes, okay, but your question is... Can, my can question you... is, my, my question is, so generally there is a, there is a, the, the sound wave is encountered by the, the front bundle or the back bundle and it matters like where the sound hits. So in yes. your model, is it possible to, to reverse the 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 starting point of this wave to see how the wave propagation would be perturbed would the wave uh, propagation be perturbed yes, at yes. all and if yes, so yes, how yes. you will need you will need a model with many of these x's yeah. and then you have to introduce another variable and also external forces that that have the the properties that you look 
So, so from the model that uh, I just showed you before, typically uh, these models, okay, they look like this. Okay, this yeah. is for one, one cell. So you will have okay. to extend the model for many cells. And then there's an external force that okay. is coming to the cell. So you need to add these forces and, and tune it in, a, in the way you would, you would like to look. Uh, moreover, you, this excess will, uh, okay, will be different in different positions. So the model will become yes. very complicated, but it's, 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 an op, uh, it's a good direction, I think. It's so the, the, this is the equation on the basis of which I was asking you the question, because you have fixed the position, right? You have you fixed the position where your wave begins. Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, maybe biologically also that is true, that that's the wave always begins in a particular position well, on uh, itself, but well, may not. Okay, this is constrained to, you take the ear of the bullfrog, you, you do a section, you take one of these guys, boom, you put yeah. it in a, in, yeah. a, in a plate and you look at the motion. This is what we are describing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not okay. not an ensemble because doing an experiment with an ensemble it's it's very challenging and and you cannot have this resolution for an ensemble you will have to do yeah, video, yeah. video microscopy and and this is less accurate so yeah yet yet it's a bit science fiction but one day it will be reality so it's it's, it's good to do for the future actually all right thank you welcome can I ask ah Rajarshi yeah yeah. Please. Right. Yeah, so this is Rajarushi Edgar. Uh, now, right. Edgar, I have a very general question. It's more about the physics part of it. This is regarding entropy production. Now, how, how the way one defines this entropy production, how unique the definition is? Because you can have a model one, model two, model three. You can break your time reversal symmetry by introducing noise, or you have two harmonic wells switching between them. Numerous yes. ways you can do. Uh, yes, and for each model, you can define uh, some sort of entropy production, and then uh, I'm just curious. Uh, the, the, yeah, I don't know. Like, what uh, is the status of this entropy production business in active matter right now? We wrote uh, some papers a few years back, but uh, yeah, I'm not much sure. Okay, uh, you're asking yeah. many questions. <laughs> just it's so, a general, generic, uh, general question I have. Yeah. Typically, in stochastic thermodynamics, we have a system with states, and oh. we say that the rate for for a to b to happen divided by the rate of b to a is uh, is related to the environmental entropy change in this process this is an assumption that we we use always in stochastic thermodynamics so for instance this would be in an isothermal bath this would be the heat over the temperature so you need you need an assumption that is the transition rates are related to to physics to heat so we have this type of assumptions and then um, you can you, uh, if you have this type of assumption, you relate the environmental entropy to probabilities of trajectories given their initial states. Uh, moreover, you, okay, this is a very long story, but yeah. typically you, you describe the entropy production as the log race of, of the path probabilities. And then the point is, where does the physics come from? So when you specialize this quantity to specific models, you start to see the physics. So if you have a Lange event model in an isothermal bath, you compute this quantity and you get the work minus the free energy. So this is if it's isothermal. If it's not isothermal, you compute this quantity and it's the system entropy minus the heat fluxes in each of the baths, for example, in a, in a Feynman ratchet. So it seems very obscure, but when you apply it to specific examples, the usual um, expression for entropy production specific to each model appear. This in the sum, in, in active matter is an open question. So you can still compute this quantity is the irreversibility, <laughs> but uh, typically you are ignoring non-equilibrium degrees of freedom. So this doesn't give you the heat, it gives you only a lower bound. So um, one has to be careful in active matter to call this entropy production. One has to be careful. So it's it's more the degree of irreversibility than than entropy production. Thank you. Thanks. Welcome. So uh, the next question is by Arno. Arno, please. Yeah. Hi. You. Hey, hi, Edgar. Uh, hi, this hello. was very very interesting talk. Uh, very hello. much liked it. Yeah. This, uh, I was just curious about this uh, physical. I mean, I understand in the model you uh, went beyond like exponential waiting time to non-exponential waiting time. 
just I was trying to understand, uh, like also in experiment, you indeed see a non-exponential waiting time which you feel with a gamma distribution. But do you understand that what is happening? Because you said that uh, essentially there is a switch between two states also in the real experiment, right? Mm. Uh, the one which you are showing. So do you understand that why actually there is a non-exponential waiting time in the, in the system itself, in the real system? Well, um... I don't know how deep is the question or do you understand, but this is a, an empirical observation. So we, we never see exponential distributions in the bundle. Never, never, because this is a system that has, so, so, so it's, it's an oscillator which has a, a characteristic frequency. Exponential waiting times, I, I've never seen in, in the right. 182 Sorry. cells that I look, never. So uh, one way you can, uh, and build this is if you think on a model with okay this is something we were thinking for a long time so if you if you think the model of the hair bundle let's say it has okay this is a very bad drawing okay <laughs> you have this model in which uh, okay now there are these deep links let's say like this here and like this here and this bundle at some point will move uh, to the left so it will this is one equilibrium position and the other one will be all these three coming here no Mm -hmm. Okay, so to switch, uh, at some point you need to, to take actions on this channel. So you need to pass from closed channels to open channels. And uh, you could do a very minimal model, which is each of these channels throws, um, throws a random number or, or has a waiting time to be uh, open. So each of these has a exponential waiting time to pass from open to close. Uh, and then you, you should have to wait until all of the channels are open. So you right. So collectively, it's a, it's a collection of exponential waiting times, essentially. Which yes, so, so, so exactly. So if you combine a collection of, of exponential waiting times, you will get something like this. Something. But, but th this is really my hypothesis. So it's, nobody has thought about this idea before. So it's, um, it, it's a nice hypothesis and Actually, this, this K here is related to the number of, of exponentials if you want to build it like this. And the K we, the K we get is around, is around 10, which is close to the number of, of ion channels. So, right. so it just reminds me of this Erlang distribution, which essentially has this, you know, like collection of waiting time, exponential waiting times, and the number of steps essentially gives you this K there. So, Yes, yes, exactly. So this is our uh, a bit of our hypothesis. We, we are trying to explore it. So uh, it's a bit intuitive by now, but uh, we're trying to verify this in, in more experiments. Right. And also just almost a similar question. So in both the cases, actually, you see the bi bimodal distribution, right? Uh, for the stationary case, right? Oh, what do you mean? Uh, what do you mean by both cases? So uh, both in uh, uh, the exponential and non-exponential waiting times, right? Yes. Yes. So how do you actually differentiate between them? I mean, like uh, in real experiment, let's say that. I mean, okay, I understand from the parameter perspective, you will probably feed something and get this. Yes. But uh, but just looking at the bimodal distribution, it is not possible for us to infer something about the waiting time. Probably. No, right? no, 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 no. That that's clear. That's clear because. The stationary distribution does not depend on the correlation. You can have different correlations right. and obtain the same distribution. So you need the way we, we feed the data is we feed the distribution and the correlation. They, they are two things. They are two phases of, of the same problem, but they are independent of each other. Nice. Okay, so it, it's different. This has information of one time. This is information of two times correlation. Mm -hmm. and. In the non-Markovian case, you have to go to beyond in reality, but as for now, this is what we can fit uh, right. experimentally. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, Edgar. Thanks, Arnav. It was a very nice talk. It was yeah. good to see you here. Same. Um, okay, so I think uh, there are no further questions, and I think we've overshot our time also by quite a bit. So th th again, uh, I think from all of us, uh, thanks, Edgar. It was a really, really nice talk. Uh, thanks to all of the participants as well. Uh, 
and for attending and for participating through the discussion session. Uh, the next colloquium in the series will be on the 13th of April. So remember, again, it's the second Wednesday of every month. So the next one is on the 13th of April, and um, it will be by Professor Rup Malik uh, from IIT Bombay. Uh, so hope to see all of you uh, there for that talk as well.